Welcome back to our second study of our series of 24 amazing lessons, where every night we will be covering the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation. Our second topic is entitled, Is There Anything Left You Can Trust? Let's begin with a story of stories. It is his story, the story of Jesus, the story of what happened at the cross. We will be looking at the story covered in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 32. The disciples of Jesus were completely devastated. All of the hopes and dreams of the new kingdom of God was nailed to the cross the previous Friday. Reeling with grief and confusion, Cleophas and his companion slowly made the seven-mile journey or 11 kilometers trip to Jerusalem, from Jerusalem down to their hometown to Emmaus. As the sun was setting that Sunday afternoon, and as they trod the way, the bumpy road, a stranger drew near to journey with them. Little did they know that this new traveling companion was the resurrected Lord himself. Paying little heed to their fellow pilgrim, the two dejected disciples rehearsed the staggering events of the weekend, feeling more despondent with every step they took. As Jesus silently listened, he desperately longed to reveal himself to his downcast friends. But the Lord deliberately shielded his identity because they needed now, more than ever, to understand the scriptures. If Christ had allowed these two faithful followers to recognize who he was, they would have been far too excited to listen to the important truths that he had to share. Even after three and a half years of listening to his teachings and preachings, they still did not comprehend who Jesus really was, the nature of his mission and ministry. He had plainly told them in Mark 9, 31 and 32, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that, he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying, and were afraid to ask him, the Bible says. Jesus gently interrupted their sad conversation. And for the next two hours, he gave them the keys to understanding all scripture and prophecy. The Bible does not really tell us the specific text that Jesus used to give them this long Bible study that afternoon that spanned from Genesis to Malachi. But it would have been the best Bible study ever. They or anyone else received from the lips of the master himself. He picked all the verses of the Old Testament and showed, showed its fulfillment in his birth, his life, his ministry, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, his high priestly ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, and his soon coming eternal kingdom and the eradication of sin and sinners, etc. What a study that must have been. Let's go to our first question. How much of the scriptures are we commanded to believe? The Bible tells us, believe in all the prophets have spoken. Luke 24, 25. All means all and not most or some of them. Today, many people like to believe only some parts of Scripture that please them. But the need is to believe all of it 
for all of it comprise the word of God. Paul wrote, all scripture is given by the inspiration of God. 2 Timothy 3.16, the complete oracles or the sacred truth of God are contained in the writings of the Old and New Testaments. The keys to understanding the prophecies of Revelation are primarily found in the stories of the Old Testament. For example, of the 404 verses found in the book of Revelation, 278 of them are echoes from other stories and prophecies in the Old Testament. So it means if we don't, do not read or understand the Old Testament teachings and prophecies and truths, we will not be able to understand the important book of Revelation. Whom did Jesus say the scriptures and prophecy reveal? Well, the Bible tells us in Luke chapter 24 and verse 27, and beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. From Moses, the author of the first book of the Bible, to all the prophets who wrote the Old Testament, Jesus showed the two disciples on the road to Emmaus that the Old Testament scriptures are all about him. The Old Testament is as much Jesus' book as the New Testament is. The power and the glory of Jesus are clearly seen in the Old Testament, and the love and grace of Jesus are clearly demonstrated in the New Testament. Together, they reveal God's complete picture of who He is. The Old Testament is the foundation upon which the New Testament is written. The Old Testament prefigured the gospel of Jesus Christ, and the New Testament is the affirmation of what that gospel is all about. Jesus told the Jews, you search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and these are they which testify of me. John 5, 39. Many people don't see Jesus in the Old Testament scriptures simply because they don't search the scriptures as they should. These scriptures contain the promise of eternal life that comes through Jesus Christ as this text reveals. The book of Revelation starts this way, Revelation 1 and verse 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. The central figure in all scripture and prophecy is Jesus, the Son of God. This captivating series will cover many themes of prophecy, but keep in mind that their primary focus of Daniel and Revelation is Jesus Christ and His kingdom. So don't take your eyes of Jesus when you study these prophetic books of Daniel and Revelation. He is the hero of these books. It all revolves around Jesus. Let's go to our next question. What is another name used in the Bible for Jesus? John, the author of the book of Revelation, he wrote in, in his gospel, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John 1 and verse 1. Thrice in this verse, he addresses Jesus as the Word. Also he wrote, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. John 1 verse 14. 
Jesus is also called the Word. Why is he called so? Because Jesus makes God's thoughts audible to us. The will and the plans of God are revealed and demonstrated through the Son. He reveals to God's creation what is the mind of the Father. Remember, it is the words that express thoughts of a person. And Jesus expresses the invisible thoughts of the Father to each one of us. As He is the express image of the Father, He is the perfect expression of His Father's thoughts as well. What kind of people did God use to write the Bible? The Apostle Peter wrote, in 2 Peter 1 and verse 21, For prophecy never came by the will of men, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. Yes, the scriptures declare that all have sinned. Yes, all have sinned. But God chose certain men and women and cleansed them in the blood of Jesus and sanctified them then God used these holy men and women to write His holy word. God sanctified these special instruments of His and infilled them with the Holy Spirit. While the choice of words are the prophets, their thoughts are of divine origin. The Holy Spirit moved them in a mighty and distinct way to produce the written word. Let's go to our next question. Eternal life comes from knowing Jesus, John 17, 3. How was Jesus known to his disciples? The Bible tells us in Luke 24 and verse 35, he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Now in the Bible, bread is a symbol of the word of God. Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Matthew 4 and verse 4. As we read and digest and follow the scriptures, we will find strength, joy, peace, and eternal life. As Jesus broke the bread and gave it to them, only Jesus can break the bread of life and feed us too. Man on his own is bound to misinterpret the divine word of God. Only Jesus, who is the word in flesh, can truly help us to understand the written word of God. We have got to invite him when we read his word to come and break the bread of life that we might be able to eat it spiritually and assimilate it and be strengthened by His Word. The Bible says it was Jesus who helped them to understand the Word as well. In Luke 24, 45, it says, Then opened He their understanding that they might understand the Scriptures. As He broke the physical bread, and fed them. Jesus also broke, meaning rightly interpreted, the spiritual bread and fed them as well. The breaking of the spiritual bread preceded the breaking of the physical bread when Jesus associated with them. So also in our lives, we need to first feed upon the Word of God before our daily bread. Let's go to our sixth question. How important should Bible study be to a Christian? Well, the Bible tells us in Job 23, 12, I have treasured the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Food is necessary to our bodies. And God's word is necessary to our souls. We all would die 
if we do not eat our physical food for a few days. And the same way, spiritually speaking, people die if they don't partake of God's word. Those who neglect God's word spiritually for some time, they die. But God has power to resurrect the dead and he will resurrect those who want to know more about God. The apostle wrote in Ephesians 2 and verse 1, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. We eat at least two or three times a day to be in health. Isn't that right? And we should do the same in our spiritual life, to be in spiritual health. You know, the devil, he hates the Bible and he will do anything to prevent people from reading God's word and understanding it. He knows that it is the prophecies that expose his plans to deceive the human race. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. It is only through the word of God we are informed of how he works to deceive. The biggest plan would be to keep us from the word of God because that is the first big step in the right direction. So do not be surprised if Satan attempts to distract you from this series of lessons or tries to get you preoccupied with other things so that you will miss this. God will make a way for those who seek to know the truth, they will find it. Proverbs 2 verses 4 and 5 says, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest her as for hid treasures, then thou shalt know and understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. May we all be sincere in our search for truth as found in God's word. The psalmist said, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Psalm 109, 19, 105. We know the value of a light only when it is night. This world is a night of spiritual and moral darkness. And the word of God is the lamp and the light to show our path as we journey through it. Unfortunately, many are walking in absolute darkness without taking the torch of truth and they do not know where they are going. As in darkness, you cannot see anything. It is dangerous to walk physically in pitch darkness, isn't it? And how much more dangerous it is to walk spiritually without the light of God's word to guide our paths. Let's go to our next question, question number seven. Who helps us to understand the Bible? Jesus said in John 16, 13, and when he, the spirit of truth is come, he will guide you into all truth. The one who inspired the prophets to write the scriptures is the one who helps us to understand it as well. Many textbooks of the world that we read are thought by someone else, but this is the textbook which is thought by the author himself. And how easy it would be if we just let the Holy Spirit teach us. He's going to guide us into all truth, it says, because truth is truth only when it is complete. If we are willing and teachable, we will know all that we need to know for our salvation. Jesus again said, but the helper, the Holy Spirit, he will teach you all things. John 14, 26. He's called the helper because he's the one who can help us to understand divine things. Without his help, 
we all will be, would be helpless and hopelessly lost in arriving at the truth. The Apostle Paul wrote, We also speak not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches. 1 Corinthians 2.13 The Holy Spirit guides us, helps us, and teaches us. He is our real teacher. He teaches us from the Word of God, which He inspired. He never contradicts the Word of God because that is His book, and He leads us back to the divine book that He has authored. Let's get to our next question. Question number eight. What must I do to be certain the Holy Spirit is guiding my Bible study? The Lord Jesus, He told us, So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? Luke eleven thirteen. It is a matter of asking God, dear friends, and He will send the divine teacher to help each one of us. We need to ask, seek, and knock. Ask diligently. Seek truthfully and knock passionately and persistently. And He has promised to reward the true seeker of divine truth. We who are evil and selfish by nature because of sin still manifest a spirit of generosity when it comes to giving gifts to our children because they are our flesh and blood. But the Father in heaven who is holy and selfless. He always gives the best gift and he, he will give you the Holy Spirit, the best when you ask. He gave us His Son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. And He also promised to give us the next best, another best gift if we ask. The third person of the Godhead, the author of scriptures, freely and liberally to every sincere seeker of truth who ask Him in faith. Jesus said, If anyone wills to do His will, he shall know concerning the doctrine whether it's from God. John 7, 17. So if anyone is willing to do God's will, God will sincerely help that person. God is certainly going to answer that kind of prayer. So when you take the Bible to study it, to understand it, offer a prayer to God for divine wisdom and enlightenment. And He has promised to send the author Himself to be your personal help and guide. No one will ever go wrong if they rightly approach God with humility of heart and sincerity of soul. Let's get to our next question. Question number nine. How does prayerful study of the Word help us? Well, the psalmist said about what the Word of God 
can do to us. He wrote, Your word have I hidden in my heart that I may not sin against you. Psalm 119 and verse 11. The word of God has power to help us to overcome sin. Someone beautifully said something like this. Sin keeps us away from the Bible and the Bible keeps us away from sin. Now, we need to decide which one is to be kept out, whether the Word of God or whether sin. I believe that we would keep the Bible in and sin out. You know, many are struggling with sin even after reading the Bible. Why is it so? It is not just about reading that will help us. It is having the Word of God stored and treasured in our hearts that will make the difference. The Word of God on the printed pages of Scripture will not help us, but when it is transferred in the storehouse of our hearts and minds, the power of it becomes our power. The Word of God is powerful, not just on the printed pages, but its real power is in full display when it comes to the living pages of the human heart. The Apostle Paul wrote, For whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we, through the patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. In Romans 15 and verse 4, The Bible like no other sacred books of other religions, is honest in its records of not just of the good acts of faith of God's people, but it accurately has chronicled even the failures and faults of God's people, of great men of faith. It shows us how when these men of faith and God's people as a whole departed from the explicit command of God, how the Lord disciplined them and chastised them so that they could turn back to Him in true repentance and God embraced them after that. The failures of the people are written there to let us know the consequences of failures and departure from God's living word. It is not meant to scare us, but give us hope that we can turn to the Lord and come back to Him despite our failures. This is a book of hope for the hopeless. The Apostle James wrote, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives to all liberally without reproach, and it will be given to him. James 1 and verse 5. Because of sin, we all lack divine wisdom. But because of the Son, the Son of God, we all can have access to divine wisdom once again. The Apostle wrote in 1 Corinthians 1.30, But of Him are ye in Christ Jesus, who is of God, made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The Son of God is the source of all true wisdom. And that wisdom that comes to us from His Word as well, because they both are called the Word of God. And through His name, we also receive wisdom that comes from the Holy Scriptures to the salvation of our souls. Let us go to our next question. Question number 10. What method of Bible study do the Scriptures recommend? Through Isaiah the prophet, God said, For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. Isaiah 28 and verse 10. God does not want us to study His Word haphazardly, or randomly. It must be systematically studied because God is a God of order. We need to build 
are block of truth, precept upon precept. It must be studied in the given context, line upon line, because anything taken out of context will be misleading. And if we cannot get the answer that we are looking for in a given context, then we need to use the larger context of the entire scripture to discover the truth. Here a little and there a little, because the author of Genesis is also the author of Revelation and all the books of the Bible. We see a grand thread of truth that beautifully connects all parts of Scripture as the Holy Spirit links these precious truths into one grand theme. Paul also wrote, These things we also speak, not in words which, which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. 1 Corinthians 2.13 Yes, the Holy Spirit teaches us to compare spiritual things with spiritual. And the most uh, spiritual thing is the Word of God inspired by the Holy Spirit. He helps us to compare Scripture with Scripture. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. 2 Peter 1.20 we must lay aside our own ideas and study the Bible by reading everything in the Scripture on any given subject, here a little and there a little, and by comparing all the verses for input. We should let the Bible speak for itself. When this is done, truth always comes through very clearly. This is how Jesus convinced the two disciples on the road to Emmaus that he indeed was the Messiah, as you can see in Luke 24 and verse 27. When people start interpreting scriptures privately, that is depending on their own wisdom and their own understanding, then they are bound to go wrong. But when they prayerfully submit to the will of God and are sincere in their conscience and depend on the Holy Spirit to guide them from Scripture alone, then God will lead them to see the truth as it is in the Bible. Let's go to our question number 11. What will studying the Scriptures do for us? Well, it will do many things. Paul wrote to young Timothy, and that from childhood you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 15. The Scriptures help us to understand God's great plan of salvation, the most important information ever given to mortals. As we read and study and meditate on the scriptures, the wisdom of the scriptures, which is the wisdom of God, will flow to us and we will become wise unto salvation. Most of all, we need to become wise in the most important matter, that's the salvation of our souls. Many are seeking and desiring salvation in wrong places. It is the word of God alone that is the source of true wisdom and salvation as well. Let's proceed to our next question. According to Jesus, where do we find the truth? The Bible says, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. John 14, 6. Also, Jesus said about God's word, your word is truth, John 17 and verse 17. Jesus and his word, the Bible, are the sources of truth for a child of God. 
One is the living word, the other is the written word. Truth is a person in the Bible and not just a principle. Though Jesus is not physically around with us, His word continues to reveal Jesus to us and the truth to us because they are all from the same source. We find the truth in God's word, the Bible. Truth is scarce, is a scarce commodity in today's world and all the people of the earth suffer as a result. The truth about everything which really matters for our salvation is found in scripture. Studying and following it and the counsels that it gives sets people free from all challenges. As Jesus said, ye shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. It frees us from sin. It frees us from errors. It frees us from deception. It frees us from Satan. It frees us from bondage. It frees us from every error. Also knowing the truth brings happiness and abundant living. Jesus said in John 15, 11, These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So the words of Jesus brings untold joy and happiness that fills us to the brim and lets it overflow so that others can be blessed as well. Let's proceed to our 13th question. What warnings regarding Bible study are given in the scripture? In 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15, we read, Be diligent to present yourself approved to God, a worker who does not need to be ashamed, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Why did he say that we need to rightly divide it? Because there are many who will wrongly divide and interpret the truths of God's word. Remember, in the wilderness temptation, Satan used the very words of scripture from Psalm 91 in one of his temptations in an attempt to deceive Jesus. He said in Matthew 4 and verse 6, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down, for it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. He did not quote some in the right context. He did not quote the complete verse. He left a part of the verse out. That is what the devil does even today through his false teachers, wrongly dividing the word of truth. They quote scripture out of context because, and they become instruments of deception. Rightly dividing the word of truth means to interpret it correctly and truthfully. There is great danger in twisting scriptures to make it say what we want it to say. What I say about the Bible matters little. What counts is what scripture says about itself. In all about Paul's writings, in all his epistles, are some things hard to be understood, which unthought and unstable people twist to their own destruction. Yes, he wrote about Paul's writings. He said in all his epistles, there are some things hard to be understood, which unthought and unstable, they twist to their own destruction. Yes, there are some things hard to be understood, in Paul's writings and in the rest of the scriptures as well as this verse indicates. But the good news is that we get from this verse is, while some things are hard to be understood, most of the things are easy 
to be understood. But the problem is people set aside the majority texts of the Bible that are plain and easy to be understood and attempt to interpret the hard ones with their own judgment and understanding. That is where they go wrong unto their own destruction. If the scripture is rightly divided as Isaiah told us how to do, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little, then it will bring salvation to us. But if the Bible is wrongly divided using human wisdom, then depending on God for answers and comparing scripture with scripture, then the word of God is wrongly understood and misinterpreted. And that paves the way to one's own destruction. You know, it's a two-edged sword that is able to save those who believe it and will destroy those who believe it not because there is no truth outside God's word. By his word, God created everything in the beginning. And by his word again, God will destroy the unbelieving world, but he will save those who believe and follow his word. Let's go to our 14th question. How should we test all religious teachings and doctrines? That's very important for us to know. In Acts 17 and verse 11, it tells us, they receive the word with all readiness and search the scriptures daily to find out whether these things were so. It's talking about the Bereans here. The first thing they did was to receive the word with an open mind. And then with faith, they embrace the word of God because without faith, it is impossible to please God. Then with sincerity and prayer in their hearts, they started to test the scriptures with what Paul was saying to see whether it was synchronizing or not. Remember, Paul was a great apostle, but the people of Berea still cross-checked the teachings of that apostle with the Old Testament writings. And the Bible calls the Bereans as noblemen because they did that. You know, it doesn't matter who is preaching the word today, however big that person might be. It can be a world famous evangelist, but we all need to test the preacher with the word of God. Isaiah wrote, to the law and to the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. Isaiah 8 and verse 20. All religious teachings should be checked by the Bible. If anything does not clearly agree with the scripture, it is false and should be abundant. The law and the testimony comprise the entire Bible. The law of God or the Ten Commandments is what God wrote with his own fingers. And the testimony of the prophets is what the Holy Spirit inspired the prophets to write down. And thus, everything must be tested by what God wrote and what the prophets wrote. Let's now go to question number 15. What happened when Jesus explained the scriptures to his discouraged disciples on the road to Emmaus? Let's see what the Bible tells. It says, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road? And while he opened the scriptures to us, Luke 24, 32, the scriptures, when heard or read with the help of Jesus and the Holy Spirit, will burn our hearts to warm us 
and to cleanse us and make us to know the scriptures when heard or read with the help of Jesus and the Holy Spirit will burn our hearts and warm us and it will cleanse us and it will make us certainly know that God is indeed leading us to his great light. Does your heart burn when you study God's word every day, dear friend? I hope it does. For our last question, question number 16, after these two disciples knew that Jesus was alive and heard him explain the prophecies, what did they do? Let's see what the Bible says. So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together. What did they do? They were on the moon to share the good news. One of the first reactions these disciples had after hearing Jesus explain the scriptures was a burning desire to share the good news with others. We hope it is also your desire to invite your friends to join in this dynamic series of Bible studies and be blessed as you listen to God's word every night. Precious truths, 24 important lessons that we can study together. Do you wish to fully understand and follow the scriptures? Dearly beloved, what a journey it was for the two disciples along with Jesus and what a Bible study with the master himself. But we thank God that the Holy Spirit, the author is sent to guide everyone who is searching for truth. I pray and I hope that you would be sincere as though those two disciples were, and Jesus will open your eyes to see the truth of God's word as we journey together along with Jesus in this amazing study. God bless you. I'm here in the beautiful island nation of Fiji that's filled with exotic animals, beautiful vegetation, and spectacular scenery. The people here are some of the nicest in the world, but it hasn't always been that way. This was once known as the Cannibal Islands. The Fijian warriors were some of the fiercest in the South Pacific and greatly feared. You can understand why. This is one of the weapons that they use for breaking the neck of their adversaries. And long before they were killing and eating missionaries, they were fighting with and killing and eating each other. In fact, as you go to the different tourist locations on the island, they'll sell you uh, remakes of some of the forks they used for eating human brains. In fact, there was one cannibal chief, Ratu Udre Udre, during the 1800s, that is in the Guinness Book of World Records for having killed and eaten the most victims. He brags that every time he killed someone, he set a stone aside, and by the end of his life, he had a pretty big pile of stones. It's estimated he ate somewhere in the neighborhood of 900 people. Oh my. You know, the Fijians were not the only ones that had a monopoly on cannibalism. In fact, the Bible says that we are all capable of being cannibals. Galatians 5.15 says, if we bite and devour one another, we may end up consuming one another. That's talking about destroying people's reputation by mean gossip. One famous missionary named Patton, when he was preparing to go to the Cannibal Isles, his friends and family begged him not to go. They said, you'll be eaten. 
He said, it doesn't matter to me if I die and I'm eaten by worms or if God wills that I'm eaten by cannibals, as long as I'm doing the will of God. Well, he went to the cannibal isles and brought many to Christ and died peacefully in his old age. Some of the ancient cannibal cultures believe that when you killed and when you devoured your enemy, you would somehow take within you their spiritual strengths or powers. But that's really absurd. But there is a kind of cannibalism endorsed in scripture. That's right. Jesus said in John chapter 6, verse 53, except you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life in you and you don't need these tools to do it. What you need is to read his word and learn about his life, accept by faith his sacrifice in your place and you can have a new heart and be a new creature. You can even do it right now. Would you like to know God's plan for our broken world as revealed in Bible prophecy? Want practical, trusted solutions for your biggest challenges? Encouraging and enlightening, Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides provide 27 Bible-based topical lessons with beautiful graphics and straightforward answers that are easy to understand. Each study guide leads you toward real, relevant Bible answers for the most important questions in your life. How can I have healthier relationships? When and how will Jesus come again? And so much more. Don't leave your future to chance. Transform your life with truths from the Amazing Facts Bible Study Guides. Available in English, Hindi, Tamil, and Telugu. Don't wait. Order your complete set of study guides today by visiting bookstore.aftv.in. Have you ever wondered what it will be like when Christ returns? Well, Amazing Facts has created this beautifully illustrated 50-page magazine that talks about the major themes of His soon return. It talks about the signs of Christ's coming. What is a secret rapture and how can you prepare? It talks about the judgment and the 1,44,000. Who are they? It talks about the millennium and the earth made new. All of this packed into one beautiful magazine you'll enjoy reading and sharing with friends. To order your copy today, please visit bookstore.aftv.in. Amazing Facts has impacted my life. And I just praise Great God life. for Amazing Facts. Amazing Facts actually did have an impact this in my life. This whole process, getting to where I am today. Facts I felt good about that. I didn't feel good again, but I felt good I began reading the Bible. I got baptized into seven steps. I realized that there had to be more to life. God is really doing this. The life that He's given. This message was so powerful. Christ wherever He goes. Amazing Facts. More than 45 years of proclaiming God's message around the world. And then the logo pops across, amazing facts. I've listened to a lot of different ministers, but he was, this was the first time that he's actually saying something where I had to grab my Bible and actually pick it up. And I've never heard this before. Let me, let me look through and find this. And I just couldn't get enough. And so I started doing Bible studies. Every single one of these guys started being changed, including myself. My question was, why did that happen to me, God? The Lord was able to reach out, and I actually saw him as a father. I lost everything, and that was when I realized that it was God missing in my life. I went to a prophecy seminar, which knocked me out. This message was so powerful and so irrefutable. I just went, this is real. This is, this is amazing. Do your kids enjoy fun things? Because I sure do. And I was so excited when my mom and dad got me the Amazing Adventure Kids Bible Guides from Amazing Facts. These lessons are very colorful and are filled with exciting puzzles and questions that make learning fun. They are full of Bible truths and will take your children on 10 amazing adventures like slaying the dragon, the only lifeboat, journey through the sea, and whistling through the graveyard. I have learned so much. Call our messages now. <laughs> 
to order the complete set today so your kids can learn some amazing facts from the Bible. Trees are beautiful and isn't it amazing that everything required to make a tree can be found inside a little seed? You know what else is amazing? Inside this little QR code is everything you need to help you grow spiritually. The Amazing Facts India Link Tree just scan it and you'll be connected to our Bible reading plan, a website, our bookstore, YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, ShareChat, and so much more. You're now connected. Scan this little QR code and start growing today. was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. Inasmuch as you do it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me.